Let's have a dissection of the day with a, a large panel here who are going to give us each one takeaway from the budget. I'm with Rupert Harrison, who's Portfolio Manager of Multi-Asset Strategies at BlackRock Investments and was an advisor to George Osborne uh, between 2006 and 2015. Mariana Mazzucato, Professor in uh, uh, economics, the economics of innovation and public value at UCL. The Financial Times editor, Lionel Barber, and Ruth Lee, who's an economic advisor at Arbuthnot Banking and a co-founder of uh, Global Vision Eurosceptic Campaign Group. Evening all. OK, you've got one takeaway each. Um, Rupert, let's start with yours. If I'm allowed two, no, I think on the, big, <laughs> on the big judgments that the Chancellor has to make, I think Philip Hammond continued to get it pretty much spot on. He's in a very difficult position where he does not know. He faces an unusual, amount, away. Come on, an unusual amount of uncertainty. So I think when it comes to caution on the public finances and investment in the long term, he's making the right judgments. I think a lot of the focus inevitably tomorrow, the front page is going to be this national insurance yeah. uh, rise. That's the risk he's taken. Uh, I think it's a sensible change. He, certainly you can defend the fact that uh, uh, the world is changing, that, that more and more people are, are choosing to, to be self-employed, that the margin between employment and self-employment is much less well-defined than it used to be, and so therefore does it make sense to have these different rates. Mm -hmm. He's made it progressive, uh, so I think he can defend it. Uh, I think the one thing we can definitely take away is we're, I think it's very unlikely we're facing a snap election. <laughs> Normally, if you're, just, if you're planning a snap election, you don't tend to do sensible but difficult tax right, changes. Right. Is there anyone here who wants to say, forgetting the manifesto breach, say that this is the wrong thing to do to kind of try and even out the treatment? Is it, or is it the right thing to do, Mariana? To... Well, it depends how you do it. So um, the fact that, you know, companies pay 13.8% of, you know, for national insurance for non-self-employed workers and zero for self-employed workers would have been one way to do that yeah. as opposed to hit uh, the, workers the workers themselves. themselves. Yeah. And also, I mean, you know, we do have the lowest rate of capital, uh, of capital gains, of corporate income tax, when there's no evidence whatsoever that those rates actually affect right. business investment. They affect profits and there's Lionel, no profit where, where, problem. Where's the FT on the national insurance change? We've come out in favour, in the principle, the economic principle of, of uh, raising the, the NIC charge because we do think we buy the fairness argument. And we also think if you look at the way the labour market is changing, you can understand that. But the politics yeah. are not so Different question. Yeah. But my one takeaway. Well, I haven't asked you your takeaway. <laughs> I'm, I'm, going to I'm, take I'm going to go to Ruth for her takeaway first. <laughs> my, We're going to get to all of you. Go on. Ruth, your takeaway well, from the budget. Takeaway, well, I was going to say I basically agree that the overall budget was right in its fiscal strategy. I mean, it was not a giveaway budget, as we know. It was a neutral budget. And I think to be cautious at this moment was correct. But my, other, if my, my real yeah, takeaway, takeaway is yet again these forecasting bodies have, been, have got it wrong. And I remember I actually wrote something for the Financial Times after the autumn statement saying that forecasters have been too too pessimistic about the reaction of the economy to the Brexit vote. And uh, so far, I'm right, but I may be wrong further out. But I think what is interesting is that the OBR has actually obviously upgraded its growth for 2017 from 1.4% to 2%, and then they've slightly downgraded it for the rest of the period. I think that's perfectly valid. And I think, you know, as the recovery is getting a little bit long in the tooth, we've had this recovery now since 2009. Unless there's a real spurt in productivity growth, I think the economy will slow down. Mm. Not, not to do with Brexit. The, the, not to the do with forecast, Brexit. The short term forecast bounces up and down. The, the medium term forecast, we just. We're going to be where we were going to be, aren't we? Isn't that yes. right? The forecast is more or less... 2020. Steady as she goes till 2020. We'll be in 2020 where we thought we were. We're crucially sticking to the judgment that there is a longer-term impact of Brexit. That is still there in the numbers, which Ruth might disagree yeah. with. But the OBR are sticking to that judgment. And, and they, they've had to make some fairly random assumptions about, about all of that. Mm. Mariana, you're, we've mentioned the Brexit word. I know what your takeaway is. Let's talk... What's your takeaway? Well... First of all, we should actually be caring about the sources of growth. Whether growth goes up or down by half a percentage point is less important than what is actually driving it. And what continues to drive growth in the UK is consumption. And that consumption, as your program showed before, is spending. But what, you know, how the spending is being financed is through credit cards, is financed through personal debt. So the ratio between personal, not public, everyone talks about public debt, the ratio between personal, private debt, and disposable income is back at record levels to what it was before the crisis. Now, the big question with Brexit is, you know, will it help? Will it hurt that? Consumer. And the investment, the investment that will fall both in the private sector, when Brexit actually happens, it hasn't happened, by the way, once it happens, oh, but also the fall in public investment that has been coming from the European Union 
to the figure, you know, between eight to nine billion between 2007 and 2014, just coming for the kind of research money that now we're starting to sort of patchily increase. You know, we need to figure that out. Right. And the 1,000 so the, the, the PhDs... Investment, investment yeah. is your main thing, is it? The, 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 the recovery or the economy is too well, consumption-reliant. Sources reliant. of growth, that's what matters. It's not investment-driven. Business is not investing enough. And they will invest less after Brexit. So the fact that we didn't even hear the you word Brexit... You don't know that. You don't know we'll, that. Let's get Lionel first, evidence. and then we'll take Ruth's yeah. Let me just have one more bite on the, on the self-employed. Just to say, the problem is that the government hasn't really reconciled, can get a, a, given a good account of how it is that they are praising, in effect, the great British jobs rev revolution, where you've got 40% or more of the new jobs created since the global financial crisis have been self-employed jobs. And if we're going to move, and we're threatening to talk about turning Britain into Singapore on the Thames, it doesn't quite match. So that's what we would like to see. Come back, big takeaway. I, I, I wanted you to respond to this one about investment. I'm going to let you have yours. Yeah, thank you very I, honestly, much. Honestly, Lionel, I, I don't want to rush through them. Do you agree that investment is a problem? I do. It is a Brexit effect that well, well, many we there, there, there are Well, there, there are other countries, apart from European countries, that are coming to Britain and creating jobs, not least uh, Japan, China and others. But where Marianne is right is that there are some signs that, yes, household debt is rising quite quickly, especially over the last 12 months, Whereas business investment is, by, by contrast, is sort of slowing down. Right. And that's a worry. That is the sort of the pessimist's tale. Well, that's Ruth. the pessimist tale. I was just saying about, if you talk, look at uh, unsecured I'm not a consumer... Dinster, by the way. I, well, well, I'm an optimist. There's data out there that one can look at. Are you, you saying the data's right? I look at it. You look at it. Get so it. what get, if pessimism get that. means? Get that. Ruth, make, make your point. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you some data. On the unsecured consumer credit is not back at the levels of 2008 mm -hmm. yet. I mean, it's certainly growing quite quickly. It's up about 10% year on year. And I, I accept the fact that that is partly driving consumption growth, which is perhaps not all, you know, it's not the whole story, but it's part of the story. But a lot of that is actually because of what's happening in the car industry. And if you look at total consumer debt, in, including all the secured debt, it's up about 4% year on year. I don't regard that so as sorry, unsustainable. This is quite important. It's so those are figures. we basically changed the way we buy cars and yes, we rent them that, now instead that is, of buying them. That's Counts as debt that, rather than that is, we look at households in the whole and you look at their assets as well as the debt they have, they look yeah. in pretty good shape. So, the, the, you know, this is unsustainable consumption right. at the moment in the sense it can't go on forever, but it probably can go on for quite a long yeah. time. That's Mariana's point discussed. Well, no, my point is actually that when you have real incomes which have actually not been increasing, you have to take out uh, debt just e even in order to stay. But that hasn't been true in the recovery overall. You know, we've got to listen to Lionel's <laughs> takeaway. He's been desperate to get it up. What is it, Lionel? The wisdom that Chancellor Hammond showed last year in ditching George Osborne's fiscal framework, which was very smart politics, I boxing the Labour Party into the position where they look, you know, t show your fiscal responsibility, but not good economics. It didn't make any real sense uh, to, to aim for a surplus at the end of Parliament. Now, having ditched that, he's got some room. And so it's good economics, uh, much better economics, and that's why we're in a better position. And why we'll have maybe £26 billion by the end of the well, parliament got, to insure, as an insurance policy. Yeah, but that's based on a lot of very steep spending cuts. I mean, Rupert, you were there with George making those, uh, George Osborne making those plans. Did you, do you agree it was the right thing? Yeah, I think it was the right thing for Philip Hammond to do. I mean, I think it is still the right thing for a country like the UK to aim for longer term to run a surplus because we have very high levels of debt. We have a very large banking system. We're very dependent on inflows of capital to sustain the way we live. Uh, and therefore, it's a bit complacent to say that we can just afford to get that debt down very slowly. I think in normal times, you'd want to be doing that a bit more quickly. And that's what running a surplus means. However, right now, we are facing a very uncertain time in the next few years. Mm -hmm. And I think Philip Hammond was absolutely right to push that to the right. But at the moment, we're sort of sailing around with no fiscal view or target or anchor at all. What should it be? I mean... Labour's uh, policy, we had Peter Dowd earlier. still an anchor. The he current... says he wants to achieve a surplus as soon as possible in the next parliament. Oh, I think that's what... Well, but everyone seems to be he, content he, with it for now. He has got an anchor, but it's not a very tough anchor, if I may say so, because he's now talking about the cyclically adjusted borrowing of being 2% of GDP by 2020, and I've been practising that all night. But joking <laughs> apart, that is a very loose target. And, of course, because the OBR is forecasting that it'll only be 0.9% of GDP, that gives him but this... Can I just quote, say something? None of this actually matters. 
matters. Last there is no Marianne, empirical it, evidence. It particularly of, the debt to GDP ratio okay, in the UK is not abnormally high <laughs> compared to other advanced countries. What actually matters is what you're investing in. The US, after the uh, crisis in 2009, had a 10% deficit, but actually invested that in areas that today's producing growth. It depends what you're doing. You, you know, you don't just. The UK is uh, actually growing the same rate as the US. In we, the need, crisis. we need to leave it there. Got to go. Yeah. Thanks all. That is it uh, for tonight.